Well, it's our final week as we take a look at the book of Acts. You, do you all feel like experts yet? You've been walking through for six weeks. You're scholars in Acts, and I, I can't wait to, uh, to dig in today as we close out this series on Acts. I am uh, so thankful for the last couple of weeks. Uh, my family was able to get away, and Greg just did a fantastic job of walking us through Acts. So I'm so, so thankful that we have. Yeah, he did a great job. So, so thankful for the team that we have uh, here as a church. It's just really an incredible team to get to be part of. Uh, th this morning, I want to stop for just a second and, uh, and just recognize that as uh, kids are headed back to school, and we've seen all kinds of stuff in the news on Delta variant, we're watching children's hospitals uh, fill up with kids that are sick, that, um, that it's, uh, we're, 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 our, we have a COVID team which is watching this and trying to respond really well and thoughtfully as, and prayerfully as a church. And uh, trying to respond as we're watching schools take precautions. And how, how we, we're always asking this question, how are we uh, taking care of each other, caring for each other, sometimes going a step further than maybe we would have to go, but in an in in effort just to care. How are we caring for our neighbors and, and friends? And so being good neighbors in our community. And we'll continue to ask those questions. I say that because this past week our uh, team took a step for our children and that uh, adults in the classrooms and things with children, we've asked them to mask. And, uh, and our team will continue to monitor as new things go into effect for schools starting tomorrow. And so we're going to continue to watch that. And I, I just want you to know this is exhausting. It's hard. I, I'm tired of it. And I am feeling the weight of that. Uh, and I know that our team, our staff, is feeling the weight of this. And as we look, we always said we're going to take the steps that we need to take and be able to open up as much as we possibly can. But if we have to put the brakes on, we'll put the brakes on. It's been so fun to be able to open as much as we have and see each other's faces uh, this summer. I've been so excited about that. And, um, and yet we we're, can we're con continue to watch. We're going to continue to be diligent. And I'm asking everybody just to pray uh, that, that this pandemic and each one of us is still held in the Father's hands, that God is at work. And no matter where you are on that, whatever level of exhaustion or how you feel about having to take precautions, I want to thank you for being a church that's been willing to do it, to compromise, to show each other grace in the midst of this. We don't have all the right answers, right? We just step forward in faith. And for being a church that's been willing to do that, I, I just thank you because we, it's, we've been able to meet and gather and point each other towards God. But I want to take a minute and just pray today. It feels like uh, that, that weight of exhaustion of this and yet recognizing that God is still God and God is still directing and guiding. So would you pray with me this morning? Father, my heart is weary as, uh, as I watch our community leaders, school systems, try to respond with faithfulness, try to find ways to still connect in community, educate kids, and, and as a church, as I watch our church leaders try to our best to minister to people, and yet we still see this pandemic all of us have friends and loved ones that um, they're finding themselves sick. And God, as we watch uh, kids be impacted in this round, it, it, uh, our hearts break. Father, I pray that you would guide us, that you would give us grace, that you would give us wisdom. Father, I also pray for the miraculous. I pray that you would bring healing. God, we, we lift this whole pandemic to you and we rest in your arms and in your grace and God as we open your scripture today as we open this word I pray that it would come alive to us God that, that, that your words would make sense that they would hit us that they would grab hold of us grab hold of our whole lives and God that we would leave here today and live your words out we pray all of this in your holy name, amen. We're going to 
kind of wrap up Acts. We've walked through from the beginning, and now we'll, we will get to the end. Uh, the first uh, beginning part of the book, we saw the church starting to form. Then we followed several different people's journey, especially Peter's journey. And then for the last couple of weeks, the second half of the book of Acts really follows Paul's journey. And we've been following Paul through there. I want us to start in Acts chapter 21. So if you have your Bible with you, your phone app, or you can follow along on the screens, Acts chapter 21. And we'll pick up in verse 8. Here, here's what you need to know. Uh, Paul is sort of at the end of his time, and he knows it. He's making what seems to be a farewell tour. He's stopping in cities along uh, the way to Jerusalem. He's stopping in cities with people that he's met along the way, where uh, churches he's uh, planted have been uh, started to start to form, and he's meeting up with them, and he's just sort of on his way back to Jerusalem. And a group of people are going with him to Jerusalem. And we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 8. It says this, Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea. And we stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. Now, you may remember back to the first week when we talked about who Philip was. You see, the disciples were doing a lot of ministry. There became a little bit of turmoil. Were we taking care of the widows and the orphans well? And they assigned seven people, uh, deacons really, uh, to become the caretakers for the widows and the orphans, to make sure that the, ser the works of service were done. And Philip was one of those seven. Then Stephen was stoned. He was another one of the seven. And Philip had to leave. Philip met an Ethiopian on his way to Ethiopia. Some of you will remember this story. He shared the gospel, and he baptized them right there without going to the session or to the elders to get permission first. So you remember that? We were a little worried about, uh, we were a little bit worried about this. Not quite Presbyterian of him, but he baptized right there. That's Philip, okay? And Philip ends up in Caesarea. This is, uh, this is up north of Jerusalem. And uh, it says this, he was one, uh, he was, uh, Caesarea, went to Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now, scholars make a little note about this, and the note is this, we have no idea why that was mentioned. We don't know if Luke, who wrote this, was trying to help Philip out. He was like, I'm going to help, uh, just let everybody know that, that we got some unmarried daughters here. We need to get them. I don't, we don't know why that, that, that's mentioned, but there it is. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Verse 10, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Okay, Paul is uh, on his way. Now we have a map. I brought, we got, brought the map out. It's been kind of fun to have this for this series and show you some maps. Uh, here's Caesarea. Here's Jerusalem. Okay, this is Turkey over here. And Paul is working his way back. He's doing the farewell tour, and he stops here at Caesarea. And he's going to go up to Jerusalem. Remember, we call it up because it's up the mountain, okay? Not because they had maps with up and down. And uh, so he's in Caesarea. They're getting ready to go up to Jerusalem. Here in Caesarea, he stays at Philip's house. And uh, a, a prophet comes up and says, you're going to be bound up. You're going to be handed over to the authority. Basically, you're going to die there. Please don't go. And he does it in a dramatic fashion. Pulls the belt off, ties him up. You're going to be tied up like this. And they say, don't go. How do you think Paul is going to respond? There's a prophet that says, don't go. It's going to be bad. How do you think Paul's going to respond? I put it on here just so you could see it. I, I, let's go forward to that passage. It says this, this is Paul's answer. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart, right? Paul doesn't want to hear this, why are you breaking my heart? I am ready to fight in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. At least if I was writing it, I think that's what Paul would have said, right? It's not exactly right. So there's a, oh, go back, go back, go back. Okay, uh, there's a little bit right there. To, I am ready to fight because that's how Paul seems to approach things. You know, it's for the name of the Lord Jesus. He's going to go do 
battle. And that's what I would imagine. He said, I'm not backing down. I'm going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to fight. But that's not exactly what Paul said. It looks like this. Okay, now we're ready. Go forward. There we go. I am ready not to fight. I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Greg uh, told us that, um, that this gospel, as it went out, turned the world upside down. You remember that? It, it, it began to turn cities upside down. It turned values upside down. As it turned things upside down, it, it, it found victory in defeat. That, that Christ went to the cross seeming to be in weakness. And yet through that, there was resurrection. That upside down logic of the cross, it pervades everything, even Paul's reasoning. He doesn't say, I'm going to fight. He says, I'm going and I'm willing to be bound. Even to die. I'm willing to go even to my own cross because that's the logic of the gospel. That God works resurrection even in broken places. He doesn't go to fight. His logic's been turned upside down. The, the old Paul would have done that. This Paul says, I, I'm going and I'm going to be Christ's no matter what happens. And I know that God will prevail. I know that his Holy Spirit will bring victory out of defeat, resurrection, even out of being bound. So Paul, he goes. They can't stop him. He goes uh, up to Jerusalem. And, uh, and in Jerusalem, just like everywhere else, we see things being turned upside down. We see the order of things being turned upside down. Basically, a, a giant riot breaks out. People get so upset that Paul is there. They say he is, uh, he is misaligning the, the Jewish way of worship. And they, they drum up some charges that, that actually are false charges, but it doesn't really matter. There's such a ruckus. There's such a riot that the authorities have to step in. They're, they're, they're trying to kill Paul, and Paul Keep sharing the gospel. But Paul lets them know that he's a, he's a Roman citizen. And as a Roman citizen, he should have a proper trial within the Roman uh, court system. Paul in Jerusalem continues to share the gospel wherever he goes with whoever he meets. There also seems to be turmoil wherever he goes because things uh, turn upside down. But as he gets to Jerusalem and he has to face trial, he calls for a, a, a trial within the Roman system, which means he has to go back to Caesarea. We have that uh, map there. It means he has to go back to Caesarea. So he's gone up to Jerusalem. He causes great ruckus there. They send him back to Caesarea. But this time, this time he is in prison in Caesarea. It is Caesarea where, where the, uh, the Roman authorities have their, uh, have their buildings and facilities. And he was actually held, we know, in the, the sort of the basement area of the palace there. And that's where he is held as a prisoner. In, in fact, uh, Paul is held there for, uh, for two years at least. Now, I... Um, I brought some pictures because he's held here in Caesarea, and I got to visit Caesarea a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. Cammie, I, my jacket has a little rock in the pocket. I need, uh, if you could bring that to me. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this is a picture here of Caesarea. It is right on the coast. This is the Mediterranean Sea out here. And they actually have the ruins of the palace where Paul was being held as a prisoner. Thank you. Nothing like forgetting the stuff you meant to bring for your sermon. <laughs> Luckily, we have good people. We have good people around. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, Paul sat right here for over two years. And, uh, and there's a, I, I brought another picture with me. There's another one here. We'll go one forward. This is uh, part of that same area. Now you're looking out. You can see these stormy waters out here. And off in the distance... Is Rome. It's a long way in the distance. It's the Mediterranean Sea, but off in the distance is Rome, the waves pounding in, crashing. You can see right here, you see this little fresco? The, the, uh, these were the tile floors, and the way they did tile floors back at the time, they would cut up little bitty stones, make beautiful designs. Those are right there where Paul said, I got to go and visit several years ago, before I was married, uh, over 20 years ago, got to go on a little trip. 
and uh, sit right, right by there. And as we were sitting there, there's a, these beautiful designed floors, but off to the side were other little pebbles and rocks sitting around. And well, I'm not proud of what I'm about to show you, but I actually, uh, I picked one up. Uh, we, I should probably return. Now, looking back on this, I, I'm sure that I, I, this should be returned, but I did pick up a little stone. It was off to the side. It wasn't part of one of the designs, I'm sure, but I picked that up because it reminds me of Paul sitting there in that prison. As he sat there, it seemed like the gospel should be stopping, but he, he continued to look off. It felt like things were shutting down. He was imprisoned. He was completely stopped. And yet Paul, sitting right there, continued to share the story. In fact, we see the stories of Scripture of the prison guards coming to faith because Paul wouldn't stop sharing this gospel message. We, we see that when he's sitting in, in this prison and other prisons, he wrote at least three letters to different churches. As he wrote those letters out to those churches, th these become our epistles. They, they not only impacted the life of those churches, they impact us even today. Paul sat there in Caesarea, and he knew that he was called off to Rome. And I just imagine him sitting there looking out over the Mediterranean, thinking about this gospel going off to Rome, writing uh, these epistles, sharing this faith with the people around him, even the guards. Well, they, they left there, and they went to Rome. Let's go uh, forward one more here. They left Caesarea eventually. He was on a boat as a prisoner after uh, trials, and, and they said, let's appeal on up to Rome. Paul appealed to Rome to get an official trial, and you can see this is a long journey for them to Rome. On the way over here in Malta, there was a shipwreck. The, uh, the ship was coming ashore. They were in heavy storms. They knew they were getting closer to the shore, and the boat started to fall apart. They uh, first were going to kill, the, kill all the prisoners because they didn't want to lose them. But one, of the, but one of the officials said, no, we want to save them. We can all do this. And they sent those that could swim on ahead to swim. Everybody else got a plank and floated on in. All the prisoners were there when they gathered. And, and in Malta, they uh, were met with a warm welcome. And guess what Paul did? He shared the gospel. He started to tell the story of this Jesus who would come, this God who would enter into our world that would have a relationship with them that could bring redemption and restoration and wholeness to their lives. He shared that story, and people started coming to faith right there in Malta, in the midst of a shipwreck, little pieces of ship all around them. And it's from there then that he goes on to Rome. And in Rome, he sits in prison Again, he's there for years, waiting for this trial. And one of the interesting things is the way that the book of Acts ends. If you, uh, I want you to go back and read through the book of Acts. That's been my uh, encouragement to you through this whole series. And if you haven't done it yet, it's not too late. You could still grab your Bible and read through the book of Acts. If we were to go all the way to the end, we would find at the end that Paul gets to Rome. And as he's in Rome, he's under house arrest there. And while he's under house arrest, people come to visit him and help take care of him and bring him food and, and things like that. And guess what Paul does with all the visitors that he meets? This is not a surprise, not a trick question. He shares the gospel, right? He starts telling this story. He starts telling this incredible impact that's happened on his life and can happen on theirs. Paul shares his faith. He has guards that have to guard him. And we have stories in the, in the scripture as we read through the letters that Paul wrote of those guards coming to faith. And he sends out, it says, all oh, the guards are saying, that are now part of the faith say hello to you at these different churches. And, and, and uh, we see people coming to faith even as Paul sits there in prison. And then it gets right to the end of the book and it says, Paul sat in prison and continued sharing his faith to everyone that came by. And then that's it. It just ends. 
there's no conclusion. It's ter- It's not. would not make a good movie. This would not be a good novel. We got no resolution. The story doesn't have, you're supposed to have a story arc. You know, Luke knows this. He, he, he's a meticulous writer, right? It's the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is meticulously written. Why is there no conclusion? We know that Paul eventually goes to trial. We know that Paul eventually dies. But that's from the tradition of the church. It's not from Acts. It's as if Luke ends the book of Acts with dot, 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 to be continued. And most scholars that look at this have come to the same conclusion. It's this. Luke did this with great intention. You see, the, the, the book of Acts is the story of the church. It's the story of the church being the people of God's Holy Spirit, the people filled with God's Holy Spirit and sent out into the world. And the story of the church does not end there. It just begins. It's dot, dot, dot to be continued because we're part of this story. We're part of this church, the very church that we see in the book of Acts. It's exciting stuff to see this book just end like that because the Holy Spirit continues his work. It's incredible. Now, that, that's, you've made it. You're all the way through the book, all right? Congratulate yourselves. Some of you are looking at the clock and going, there's got to be more. That, that's not, we're not done. No, I've got a few more minutes, and I'm going to take every one of them, okay? <laughs> You'll be all right. Hang with me. Hang with me. Paul's sitting there in Rome. He had to get to Rome. Now, when I look at that map, it looks like Rome is the furthest stretch. It's the edge, it's the edge of the map, right? It's the furthest stretch of, of the world, but that's not true. Rome was the center of the world at that time. It was the very center. All roads lead to Rome. You've heard that before. They also lead out from Rome. Paul had this sense of calling when he sat in Caesarea, looked out over that ocean, just imagining going to Rome because Rome was the center out from which the gospel would spread. When Paul, uh, when, when uh, Luke leaves us right there in the middle of the story saying, to be continued, he's shown us how the gospel got to the center of the world and then began to go in every direction, to every corner of the earth. It's in the center of the world that we, that we leave the book of Acts. The book of Acts walks us through what the church looks like, who the church is, what the character of the church is to be. That's why I love doing this study with you, getting this chance to just, just kind of walk through this book because it, it tells us who we're supposed to be. There, there are three key things I want to highlight, and we'll take a look at a, at a little story for each one. There, there are three key things you see the church doing. The, the, the first is this. The church, all the way through the book of Acts, should have stopped and started focusing in. The, the church had all kinds of internal problems. We saw them in Acts. They always had to work things out. They, they didn't always get perfectly along. They, they had to pull out the seven to make sure that people were taking care of the widows and orphans. They, they had to go to the Jerusalem council to kind of work out what, what, is, what, do you have, what are the rules you have to live out to be a follower of Christ. They, 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 they had all kinds of internal problems. They also had all kinds of external pressures. They were being persecuted in many different directions. The, the, the leaders of the church, we've watched them through the book of Acts, ended up in prison and jail. And it wasn't like a couple of days. It wasn't like a little, a little prison, a little, a little jail sentence. No, it was years and years. They were stopped dead in their tracks over and again. The gospel should have stopped right there. The church should have stopped and said, you know what? We've got, we've got a good group. This is bigger than we ever thought it would be. We should just take care of each other and worry about each other and deal with our own problems. And yet, all through the book of Acts, constantly, the church is turned outward. They continue looking out. They continue on the mission to which they were called. They keep looking to take the gospel to the next place, to the next group of people. They keep saying, this is good news, not just for us, but for our friends and for our neighbors. This is good news, not just for us, but for the people that live over there and the people that live over there. This is good news, not just for people that think like us and have the values that we have, but for people that think very differently, have very different values, and yet it is good news for them. This is a message that people need to hear, that they're longing to hear. And the gospel keeps going out. The church keeps looking outward. We were called in Matthew 28. That's that great commission. 
where we're told uh, that that commission we talked about several weeks back, where the commission for the church is, as you go, make disciples, teaching them to obey, baptizing them, right? As you go, make disciples. And the church throughout the book of Acts continued to make disciples, no matter where they ended up, even when they ended up in prison. Let, let's look at one, uh, at one case of this, okay? This is chapter 26. Turn to chapter 20, Acts chapter 26. And we'll pick it up in verse, uh, in verse 28. Acts chapter 26, pick it up in verse 28. Paul is on trial. It's one of his many trials through the book of Acts. Paul's uh, standing there in chains, and he is speaking to Agrippa. Agrippa is a man of great authority. And as he's speaking to Agrippa and he's on trial, somehow Paul managed to work into his, uh, into his criminal defense a story of the gospel. Right? Paul starts to say, King Agrippa, y you, you, need to, you need to turn your life to Christ. And I, and I love this. This is chapter 28, uh, 26, verse 28. Chapter 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa says to Paul, do you really... Uh, I added, really. Let's do it right. Okay. Do you think, I, I just, just, that's how I felt. It was probably went over. Okay. Do you think that in such a short time, you can persuade me to be a Christian? I, I love that. It, it, it's like, uh, here, here, just see this scene. Here's Paul in chains, looking up to this magistrate that, that has all kinds of authority. Here he stands, and he's saying, look, you really need to turn to Christ. And, like, and he's like, are you kidding me? Are you crazy? You, I mean, do you think that that's really going to work? And Paul's response is so, it's just so Paul. It's so beautiful. Verse 29, Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God. That not only you, but all who are listening to me today become what I am. Except not these chains, right? Because you have to throw that in here. Because you realize, you know, he's standing there in chains. We don't want everybody to be a prisoner. He, he just wants everybody to be a Christ follower. But here he stands and he goes, what? Of course I want you to, I think I could convince you of the gospel. Not just you. Everybody in this courtroom should turn their lives to Christ. No, no matter what the odds, no matter where they found themselves, no matter what prison he was in, the gospel continued to look out. The church continued to look out. The church continued to say, those that are far from me, they matter to God. Continually, over and over. Okay, that's one. Two, first thing the church did, it continued to look out. It continued to reach out. The second thing the church did is it grew, not just in numbers, but it grew in relationship with each other and faith. So it didn't only do out. There, there's an internal uh, component to this as so, well. Th they said, you know, it matters that we care for each other relationally. In fact, at the beginning of the book of Acts, that's the original story right at the beginning. It says they, they devoted themselves to one another in such a way that it blew people away. People wanted to be a part of that. There was this little community of misfits, really, that God began to work on and form, and people came together and loved each other from the top of the social stratosphere to the very bottom. They loved each other and cared for each other and were devoted to each other. People that were of vastly different opinions and ideas and cultures and backgrounds, they began to love each other and care for each other and be devoted to each other. It was this beautiful picture of a place that we all want to be a part of, a place where they could really be themselves, really broken as they really are are and yet understand full grace, what it means to be fully loved and challenged to be a new person. This incredible community grew in relationship, and you see it all the way through the book of Acts. I want to pick up one example. This is chapter 20. In, in chapter 20, we pick it up in verse 35. You see this, this little picture. Paul's on this farewell tour, and he's stopping at these different cities on his way to Jerusalem for trial, and, uh, and Paul stops in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, you just get this little picture, chapter 20, pick it up in verse 35. It says this, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words that Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And then we get this little picture of just intimacy right there. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. Here he is meeting with the church, this little church. He knows he's going. He knows he's going to trial. 
He says, uh, when he finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed, and they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to his ship. This little community of people loved each other so deeply. And I just love, that, just, that gives us that little picture, this group of people loving each other, hugging each other, embracing each other. They didn't always get along. In fact, there are all kinds of disagreements. And yet the Holy Spirit bound this group of people together. They grew in relationship, but they also grew in their understanding of the gospel. They, they also grew in their, in their faith. And we're told right from the beginning that, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. And that they were, they were taught constantly by the apostles about, about the gospel story. They, they read the scripture together and studied scripture together. It was important all the way through. We won't get to read it, uh, but if you were to read through the rest of chapter 20, you would see that one of the other stops that Paul made on his farewell tour was in Troas. And in Troas, Paul wanted to tell them just a few things. In fact, he had a lot to say. His sermon in Troas was sort of a record-breaking sermon. He, he went on, it says, scripture makes a real great point of this. It says, he went on till midnight, and then he preached some more, right? All the way to midnight, and then some more. It tells us there was a young kid named Eutychus who was sitting in the window of this upper room that the church had rented. That's, that's where they were meeting. And this kid Eutychus is sitting in the, in the window, and they didn't have glass in their windows. Uh, you get that right back then. They, they, no air conditioning. So they open window, kid sitting in the window. Paul preached all the way till midnight, and then some more, right? Some of you are looking at the clock right now. You're like, it's pretty close. So you, just saying, uh, midnight and then some more. And the scripture tells us Eutychus, listening to Paul, fell asleep and fell out of a third story window and he died. I'm not kidding you. Paul preached someone to death. You guys think I have gone on to. Paul preached a person to death. They were devoted to the teaching. Then Paul runs down the three story steps. They said they picked him up dead. Paul goes down, grabs the kid, and it says, There's life still in him. You would think they would celebrate, and they, they do tell us that the kid was okay later, if some of you are worrying. But uh, you would think there would be a celebration, but not Paul. Paul runs back up the stairs and finishes the sermon. Because you got to keep going, man. You can't let that stop you. The church continued to focus out. The church grew in their relationship with each other, in their knowledge and understanding of the faith. You know, Greg told us uh, a couple weeks back that what the gospel does is begin to reorder our loves. And you can see that all the way through the book of Acts. It reorders our loves, the way we view the world, what, what matters to us in the world. And that's how they did it. They, 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 they taught the gospel. They taught. And they grew in faith together. And it was over time that their, their loves began to be reordered. That's what the church does. One more thing. One more thing. The church, the church equipped everyone for a calling in ministry. It wasn't just a pastor thing. We talked about that. We saw the Holy Spirit enters into this group of people. That's the identifier of who the church is. It's the, the people of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives everyone gifts for ministry. They look very different ways. There are all kinds of different ways of leadership and gifts that are being exercised throughout, throughout Acts. But all of them are the ministry of God. And each person would find their gift and use it. Some uh, would use their gift of, of leadership in the community, and, and others were, were gifts of servanthood. And, man, there were just all kinds of gifts. People would care for each other and love each other, and they were used to do ministry. And the church equipped them to do it. It released them to do it. We see it all the way, all the way through Acts. We see young leaders being raised up. We see the church equipping people. We'll do uh, one quick story. This is chapter 18. In chapter 18, uh, we hear about this rising star. His name is Apollos, 1824. It says this, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Alexandria was where the huge library was, North Africa. That, that was the learned center of, of, the, of the world at that time. And he comes from there. He came to Ephesus, a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor. And he taught about Jesus accurately, Though he knew only the baptism of John, 
He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of the God, the way of God, more adequately. Priscilla and Aquila were the, they were equipped to be the leaders, a husband and wife, and they were equipped to be the the leaders uh, in that little church community. When they heard Apollos preaching, they thought, "Man, this guy, he's got great fervor, he's got great passion, he's he's very well learned, but he doesn't quite have it all." Some translations say they pulled him aside. They just explained to him. The way of God more accurately, verse 27, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. The church looked at the leaders that were around them and said, I want to encourage you in your gifts of faith. And they came alongside. That's a great little story. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, the leaders of the church, saw this guy with great potential. They pulled him aside and they said, look, we just want to guide you in the right way. We just need to uh, educate you just a little bit further. We need to equip you for ministry. And it's cool. We see it all the way through Acts. We've seen the church continue to look outside. Look for those who are lost, who are far from God. We've seen the church continue to build each other up. Build each other up in relationships. Build each other up in the faith and the understanding of the knowledge of the gospel and the scriptures. We've seen the church equip people and release them into ministry. And we'd be that kind of a church. See, because the Acts was to be continued. One of the great things that we, we get in this story is that shipwreck. You guys remember the shipwreck? You know, when, when Paul was headed to Rome and the ship wrecked, there's boards everywhere. There's this little story that happens right in, the, right in the middle of that shipwreck. It's chapter, uh, it's chapter 27. And I, I just want to end with this today. This little story, right in the middle of the shipwreck thing. It's verse 33. It says this, Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. See, they had been in the middle of storms, and they were throwing off all their provisions. They saved back just a little bit, but they knew they were wrecking. They knew that this was, this was tumultuous, this was bad. And so Paul kind of stands up, even though he's one of the prisoners, and he stands up as a leader, and he says, uh, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Get this, the, the ship's wrecking. It's, 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 uh, the storm is all around them. Boards are falling off the ship. They're going to they're gonna have to swim for it to make it to shore. And he's, he's, he knows because, because God has told him he's going all the way to Rome. He says, not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And I want you to hear these words. After this, this is verse 35. After this, he said, after he said this, he took some bread. And he gave thanks to God in front of them all. And then he broke it, and he began to eat. Do those words sound familiar to you? He took some bread, and he broke it, gave thanks, he broke it, and began to eat. It says all of them were encouraged and started to eat as well. But those words, you're meant to, you're meant to catch that. That's meant to catch your ear. Luke is telling that in a certain way. He's giving you this reminder. The storm is all around them. It's all around Paul, and he stops in the middle of that, and there's this moment, like a moment of communion. He stops. He takes the bread. He gives thanks. He breaks it. You hear that familiar language? It's meant to be there. You see, right in the middle of this storm, when, when things seem to be at their worst, when things are all falling out around him, he stops and he remembers Christ's presence with him. That's at the center of Acts, all the way through Christ's presence with this church. Paul becomes Paul. He's, he, he becomes a, a follower of Christ because Christ showed up with him. Christ's presence is in the middle of this, even in the worst storm. When I look at our culture around us, when I look at the world that we're in, and I think about us as a church, and I go, will we make any difference at all? It seems like such tumultuous storms around us. I just want to stop sometimes and go, it's just too hard out there. Let's just take care of each other. In the middle of that, I'm reminded that the very heart of what we do is this moment where we stop, we break bread. Why? To be reminded that Christ is at the middle. 
And at the middle is this story of a God who loved his world so much and everyone in it that he came to this earth, that he lived a sinless life, that he died for us, his body was broken, and that he was resurrected so that we might experience resurrection even when storms are all around us, even when it seems like things are falling apart. There is the power of this resurrection. It's right in the center. It's in the middle of this story of a shipwreck in Acts. Would you pray with me today? God, you've given us this unbelievable scripture. And what I can't wrap my, my mind around is that you call us, our church, to be part of it. Father, would you make us a church that is always always centered on you, your presence with us, that we would die with you so that we be resurrected with you. And Father, may we be a church that continues to look out, that builds each other up, and that equips people for ministry. Make us an Acts church. We pray this in your name.